Hey there, this is your old pal, Mr. Cook, and we are going to go through transformations of functions. So what that uh, means is that we're gonna take a base function called a parent function, and we're going to change it around, like add numbers onto the x values, add numbers onto the functions themselves, and multiply numbers onto the functions and the x values as well. Okay, so um, the transformations can shift the graphs around, move them up and down, left and right, um, dilate them, make them larger, make them smaller, rotate them around axes, and reflect them over uh, axis, uh, axis lines. So um, that, it's really similar to the stuff that you guys learned in your geometry class about taking, uh, you know, like a shape, like a circle or, or a triangle or something, and, you know, knowing where the coordinates are for the triangle and then undergoing some uh, change to the x values and the and the y values in the coordinates. So like if I had some coordinate x, y, you might remember the notation that um, maybe the x values got uh, added three onto the x value and then the y values were subtracted by two or something like that. And that did some changes to the triangle at, you know, when it was graphed out like it was on a coordinate axis. Each uh, coordinate in this case would be moved to the right by three and then it'd be moved down by two, okay? So that's what the different changes did to the, to the graphs. Very similarly, we're going to change the coordinates in uh, some of the graphs that we're graphing out in our algebra class. So the ones that we're gonna work on are uh, primarily um, quadratics, cubics, absolute values, uh, but we can also apply it to other functions like square roots, linear equations, constant functions. There's all sorts of different stuff. The transformations that we learn here affect all different parent functions that we have. And if you want a little bit more information on the parent functions themselves, consult your notes, because those, um, those notes have the parent functions and then also how they graph out how they look and all that stuff. Uh, we're just gonna simply talk about the functions and how the functions look under the transformations and how to identify when a transformation has occurred. Okay, so um, what we're going to do is uh, kind of go through some examples keep adding numbers onto existing functions and see how they change the functions themselves. And we're gonna use our calculator to see how that looks on the graph. So I'm gonna start off with just a regular old quadratic function, x squared, that's the parent function of x squared. So our function, f of x, is x squared. Okay, so first what I'm gonna start doing is adding and subtracting numbers onto the x value and see how that changes stuff. So I'm gonna change my function a little bit, and what I'm gonna do is change the x value so that it's gonna add some number onto it inside of the function, the square function. So it'll look something like this. X, maybe let's do a plus two, so plus two squared. So let's compare those two on our, uh, our graphing calculators. Okay, so I'm gonna graph out x squared first. So x squared and then I'm gonna graph it out, and there's our graph. So there's the first one right there. Okay, now I'm gonna keep this top graph uh, as x squared, and I'm gonna you know, change around the graph with y2, y3, and all that stuff to see what kind of changes that we get. So the first change that we underwent was just adding some number onto the x value. So we do parentheses and then x plus two, and we square it. So just by adding some number onto the x value itself, let's see how it changes the graph. So here's our original graph, and it looks like our graph, the entire thing has been shifted over by two points um, to the left. So you see that the vertex here has been moved over to here, exactly one, two, you know, two points over. Every coordinate that you see, this one's been moved over one, two to this point, and so on. So that implies that whenever we add a number, you know, some number onto the x value um, inside the function, that means that it's going to shift the graph over to the left by two full units. Okay, so this tells me um, that it's possible that the graph moves to the left um, by however many units that I have in there. Let's say that it's two for now. And let's let's prove that uh, the number actually uh, can change, and that'll affect how many of them moves over to the left or to uh, to the left in this case. So, if we change that number to a four, it should move the graph over to the left by four. So here's the original graph, and now the graph, the entire thing moved over to the left by four full units. Okay. So now I'm going to uh, make another guess here and say that if I were to change the sign in here to x minus two, 
then it'll change in the opposite direction. It'll move over to the right instead of over to the left. So let's see if that's the case. So use our graph, change it to a minus two. So minus two, there we go, and then graph it out. There's our original graph, x squared, and then sure enough, moving over to the right by two units is our new graph, our transformed graph. So when you subtract two on the x value, that is gonna move the graph, oops, uh, moves, there we go, to the right by two full units, okay? And then once again, you know, you can just test it out if you want. We can change the number and it'll just move it over to the right, however many, you know, we put in that number. So here's the original function. And then since I put in four, it moved the graph to the right by four units when it finishes graphing, there we go. Okay, so that tells me that uh, for this part of the transformations, when I'm adding or subtracting by some value, it's going to move uh, in the x direction. So if I add or subtract, on the x value inside the parentheses, it's going to move the graph to the left or to the right. It's going to move the graph to the left if I'm going to be adding some number onto the x value. It's going to move the graph to the right if I'm subtracting some number onto the x value. Okay, And I'm just going to show you something that's pretty cool with this. Um, this same uh, process of moving it to the left or the right actually doesn't depend on the fact that it's a square. It can be any function at all. So I'll just show you something that's a little bit different. And let's try, um, instead of x squared, let's try an absolute value function and see how that works. So you get absolute value by going to the math button, going to the right, and then there's absolute value right there. Okay, so I'm going to do the absolute value of x just as my parent function. And then I'm going to do the absolute value of uh, something else. Let's see your x. And then let's try plus 2. So under our rules so far, this implies that with this transformation of adding 2 inside the absolute value should move my graph to the left by 2 units. Let's see if that's the case. So if we hit graph, then we see that here's the absolute value function. And just like what we predicted, uh, the transformation makes our graph move to the left by two units. So it doesn't matter if I have a square here or if it's an absolute value or to the third power, if it's a square root, whatever. The graph is going to move the original graph to the left by two units if I do this transformation. So that's how transformations are going to work. We're going to establish some rules with, our, with a general idea of like what happens to the functions when we're multiplying or adding or subtracting in different places. And then we can interpret how it looks based off of those changes. Okay, so now let's go over to um, the next part. And that's going to be adding or subtracting a number outside of the parentheses of the function. So how does that look? If we took x squared and just simply added to outside of the square, let's see what happens. Okay, so I'm going to graph again. Uh, start up with my regular function that I want, which is x squared. That's the parent function. And now let's do this new one right here, x squared plus 2. Okay, let's see what happens. So I hit graph. There's my original quadratic. And then here's my transformed quadratic. So what's happened is, if you look closely, the vertex has been moved up by two units. And in fact, every single coordinate that you have has also been moved up by two full units uh, in the positive y direction. So the transformation that happens here, if we add two outside the parentheses, is that the graph has moved up by those two units right there, so up by two. So now let's see what happens if we change that number around, okay? So we go over to y equals, and let's change it to a five. So x squared plus 5, and I assume that it's going to move the graph up 5 units, and sure enough, the original function has moved up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 units. Okay, so just like what happened over here with the opposite directions from the opposite signs, I'm going to guess that if I change it to subtraction, my graph is going to move down by 2 units. Let's see if that's the case. Okay. So two units, and let's see here. So we change that second graph to minus two and graph it out. There's our original graph right there. That's x squared, the parent function, and sure enough, 
the new function, the transform function, the vertex and all other coordinates have been moved down, shifted down by two full units. So this tells me that if I were to have any function at all, if I have addition or subtraction inside the parentheses, so inside of a square, inside of a square root, inside of an absolute value, it moves it to the left or to the right. If I have addition or subtraction outside of those parentheses or outside of the function, then that means that it's going to affect it vertically, so it's going to move it up or down by some amount. So that means that if I add or subtract some number outside, then it's going to move up if I'm adding some value k at the end, and it's going to move the whole graph down. Oops, let me rewrite that. My ink's going a little bit dry there. So down if I subtract by some number k. Okay, so those are uh, the translations that we get, moving left or right, moving up or down, and it's simply through addition. But you need to make sure that you understand where the addition is going to take place before you can tell if it's going to be up or down or left and right. Okay. So, now let's take a look at what happens when we multiply some number out front. All right, so I'm just gonna multiply um, two onto the x squared. So I'm gonna do two x squared and see what happens with my graph. Okay, so changing that up, keep the x squared where it is, and I'm gonna change this so that it is two, and then x to the second power, there we go. And then hit graph. So there's our original graph, x squared, and then if we double the function, it looks like it's become more narrow. Okay, so I'm going to, um, I realize that the function has become more narrow, but I'm going to graph a couple other ones with bigger numbers and see what happens. So let's try 4x squared. So now I'm graphing that on top of it, and 4x squared makes it more narrow. Okay, let's try another one, maybe a larger number like 10x squared. I'm going to guess that it's going to get more narrow. Let's see if that's the case. Yeah, sure enough, that graph got even more narrow. So that's telling me that the larger that the A value is, the more narrow that the graph gets compared to the original function. So um, that's going to be a general case, and we call that a vertical stretch. Okay, so what happens is that if this number that's multiplying out front A is larger than 1, then that means that it undergoes something called a vertical stretch. And we just simply say that it has a vertical stretch of whatever the, the number is outside. Like if it's multiplying by 2, then it's a vertical stretch of, of a factor 2. If it's 2.8, then it's a vertical stretch of a factor of 2.8. If it's 1.112, it's a vertical stretch of a factor of 1.112. You get the idea. Okay, so we've seen larger numbers, and that's what happens with those. We know what's going to happen if we have that number at exactly 1, right? Because if we multiply anything times one, it's itself. So really, if we just put one in there, it should be the exact same function that we graph, you know, x squared, so here's x squared, and now here's one times x squared graph right over it. There it is, the red line. See, it's just the exact same thing. So that's what happens when, when a is equal to one, nothing, nothing changes about it. So let's see what happens when we pick an a value that is um, less than one, so less than one, but let's say bigger than zero, because if it was zero, it'd just like eliminate everything, so that wouldn't really help out much. So let's pick a number that's between one and zero, like maybe um, one-third, so I'll put one-third as a fraction in front of x squared and see what happens with the graph. Okay, so I put parentheses, one over three, and then x to the second power, and I graph it out. All right, so there's my original graph, x squared, and then here, is one-third x to the second power. So that's kind of weird. It makes the graph go out wider like this, okay? In the, in the x direction, it's kind of stretched out. What we call that is a vertical compression. So vertical compression. Okay, and then very similar to the vertical stretch, we call it a vertical stretch uh, compression of like one-third or one-half. We just, you know, say what it multiplies by, essentially. Okay, so this a value here, has a couple of rules applied to it, okay? So depending on what number is multiplying out front, basically we get the following. Okay, so this pen is pretty much dead. I'll switch over to red. Hopefully you don't mind that it's two different colors. I don't, so I don't, I don't really care. A, when A is greater than one, we have a vertical stretch. You can just write VS for vertical stretch if you want. If A is between one and zero, 
then that means that we have vertical compression or VC vertical compression. And remember that vertical stretch means that it gets more narrow and vertical compression means that it gets wider. Okay. All right. So those are the transformations that we're working with for the most part. There's one last thing that we need to talk about and that's reflections. So reflections are going to be when we use negatives on either the function itself or on the X value. So once we've identified all of those, I'm going to do, do a second video because this one's getting a little bit long, just about identifying transformations based off of how they look in a function. Okay, so here we go. Let's uh, do the negatives. So if I just put a negative on the X value, so um, inside of the X value, let's see what happens. And I'm going to switch from uh, using X squared into something else, all right? So just, you know, because we've been using a lot of X squareds, I'm going to do something uh, with a different function. Let's use X to the third power now as our parent function. So if I put a negative on the X value inside the parentheses, so parentheses, negative x to the third power. Let's see what happens when we graph those out. So I'm getting bored of graphing out these quadratics. So clear that out, clear that out. And let's go ahead and graph this. So x to the third power, and then parentheses, negative x to the third power. There we go. Okay, so graphing out both of those. Here's our original cubic expression, x to the third. And here's our other function graphed out. Okay, so notice that a lot of stuff has changed here. Basically like what this negative does when it's attached to the x value, it makes all of the negative, all of the, uh, not negative, but all of the possible x values change signs. So if I had a coordinate like this on the graph, 1, 3, what this negative does is that it changes that coordinate to a negative 1, 3. Okay. So it changes the sign on it. So you can see like back on our graph over here, uh, and I'll even show you some examples on the table. Okay, so when our x value was, um, let's see here, one, it would have been one, one for x to the third power. Now when it's on x to the negative third power, it will change to a negative one, one. See, negative one and then one for our second function over there. Pretty interesting, right? So this transformation, when we have a negative on the x value, what it basically does, uh, you know, in, in our transformation um, language, it, 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 it does a reflection. And the reflection that occurs is over the, uh, let's see here, which one was it? The y-axis, yeah, there we go. I just have to remember that, trying, trying to think about that. Um, and if we put a negative outside the parentheses on our function, like if we had a negative a value, for example, that's multiplying, it's a reflection over the x-axis because it affects the y values and it just changes the signs on them. So um, now I'm going to uh, stop this video short, just uh, kind of explaining all the transformations that happen. And what we're going to do is use this information and identify some transformations just based off of how the functions look in the next video.